Thank you for joining us today for this special event to honor the legacy of uh, Professor Des Ball, AO. It's unfortunate that we can't gather together in person to celebrate Des's memory and share some stories. However, I'm glad that we're still able to virtually mark this important event in the school calendar. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge, celebrate, and pay my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of the Canberra region and to all First Nations Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and work and whose cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. I'd also like to acknowledge Des's family who are with us today, Annabelle, Ray, Katie, Matthew and James and longtime friend Nancy Viviani and Professor Wang Gangyu, former director of the Research School of the Asia and the Pacific. It's great that you could all join us via the wonders of technology. Also with us today is the Honourable Professor Gareth Evans, AC, former Chancellor of the ANU and a colleague of DESERT's. Thank you all for joining us. Desmond Ball was head of the ANU Strategic and Defence Studies Centre from 1984 to 1991 and continued with the centre in a variety of roles, including as Emeritus Professor until his death in 2016. Not only was he a remarkable scholar and contributor to global scholarship, he was also a much loved colleague and friend to all in SDSC and to many here in the audience who remember him with fondness. His legacy continues to live on in academic and policy work done in Australia and elsewhere. In 1986, Des was elected as a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences of Australia. And then in 2014, he was made an officer of the Order of Australia for his service to international relations as an academic, author and researcher, as well as for his work on Australian defence policy formulation and to the security architecture of the Asia Pacific region. Des was a prolific writer and crafted a body of scholarship consisting of more than 40 volumes to address topics of vital importance to Australia's national security, including nuclear strategy, signals intelligence, defence acquisition, and the strategic culture of the Asia Pacific region. Fittingly, Des was honoured with a fetch grift of essays published in 2012. Today's lecture, uh, China and Russia in a de facto alliance, is a topic which we suspect would have been of great interest to Des, particularly as it will be delivered by his friend and colleague of many years, Emeritus Professor Paul Bibb. Paul is also a former head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre here at the Coral Bell School of Asia and Pacific Affairs, and now a highly respected Emeritus Professor and a continuing active contributor to the current debates on defence and strategic policy. This contribution is particularly important now as we go through significant change in the Indo-Pacific strategic environment. Prior to his time at SDSC, Paul held a distinguished career in the public service as head of the then Joint Intelligence Agency and as the Deputy Secretary for Strategy and Intelligence within the Department of Defence, where he oversaw the transformation of the Joint Intelligence Agency to the Defence Intelligence Organisation. He also held responsibility for the Defence Signals Directorate during his time. In 1986, as a consultant to the Defence Minister, Paul penned his review of Australia's defence capabilities, colloquially known as the Dib report, which became a highly influential document in the development of the 1987 Defence White Paper and led to significant changes in Australian defence policy, in Australian defence policy. In my opinion, the Dib report, as it is known, is one of the great Australian books because it says so much about Australia and its relationship with the world. In 1989, Paul was made a member of the Order of Australia for his contributions to national intelligence and defence policy. Paul is also the author of the book Inside the Wilderness of Mirrors, 
an insight into how Australia saw the threat from the Soviet Union during the Cold War era. He continues to publish and most recently collaborated with Richard Bravin Smith to publish in ASPE strategy, to publish in ASPE strategy on deterrence through denial, a strategy for an era of reduced warning time. Before Paul begins the lecture, I would like to request that you please turn off your video cameras and ensure your microphone remains muted. Following the lecture, I will moderate a short question and answer session at which time videos can be turned on. If you have questions, please post them in the chat box and I will then call upon you to unmute and ask your question. Thank you. I now invite Paul to begin the lecture. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Brendan. I was a colleague and friend of Des for over 40 years. And in that entire 40 years, by the way, he never once asked me a question about Pine Gap, which I was deeply involved with for 20 years, that he shouldn't have asked me, not once. I well remember regularly on Friday nights in the late 70s and throughout the 80s, every Friday night going to the National Press Club, drinking beer with Des, and also with other people there of significance, um, like Donald Ralph Marshall, ASIO's head of uh, Soviet counter-espionage, and from time to time also in that drinking circle, Lev Koshlyakov, the KGB resident. Now, that would be something to write about, I think. I also want to acknowledge that uh, Annabelle, his wife, is uh, online with us, Ray, his sister, and the three children, Katie, Matthew and James. Well, turning to the subject of China and Russia, it's a contentious subject. There are important views for and against. I hope I will balance those views fairly and then let you know my view towards the end. So, the growing challenge from China these days tends to crowd out attention in Australia to other enduring threats including those coming from the military alignment of Moscow and Beijing. Over 20 years ago, Zbigniew Brzezinski, the formal national security advisor to President Jimmy Carter, said that the most dangerous scenario to the US would be a grand coalition of China and Russia, and I quote, an anti-hegemonic coalition united not by ideology, but by complementary grievances, end of quote. This August, the commander of the United States Strategic Command, Admiral Charles Richard, has warned that it is a mistake to think about China and Russia in isolation of each other. Their continued defense relationship, he said, should not be underestimated or ignored. He also said that the biggest nightmare for America was that there would be even closer ties between Beijing and Moscow. This would face the US for the first time in its history, he said, up against two nuclear competitors, major ones at that, instead of just one. Earlier this year in April, the NATO Secretary General, Jen Stoltenberg, also observed that Russia and China have been cooperating more and more recently, both at a, at a political and military level, and that this new dimension, he said, was, and I quote, a serious challenge for NATO, close quote. He also said that Moscow and Beijing are, increasing, are increasingly coordinating their respective positions. And in addition, both countries conduct joint military exercises, test long range flights with military aircraft, including nuclear capable bombers, and conduct maritime operations together. And they also carry out an intense exchange of experiences, he said, on weapon systems and internet control. This strategic partnership has deepened to provide for advanced Russian military equipment sales to China in a way that Russia was careful not to do before. Generation fighters such as the Sukhoi 35 relatively quiet kilo class conventional submarines, advanced air defense systems, such as the S-400, which is one of the best air defense systems in the world, and Russian construction in China, 
of powerful ballistic missile attack early warning radars, which is a very significant development. There have been joint exercises in the Baltic Sea and the East China Sea, and the rendezvous of nuclear capable Russian and Chinese strategic bombers over the East China Sea. They are also stepping up their cooperation on such issues as artificial intelligence. So, the central geopolitical question now is, how enduring is this relationship and is it already a de facto alliance? Although we are clearly facing a rapidly growing military partnership between China and Russia, this does not mean a formal NATO type alliance. Indeed, many com commentators see this relationship as one merely of convenience, driven by the hatred of China and Russia of the West. This line of reasoning concludes that when this relationship becomes inconvenient, it will be because of entrenched Russian and Chinese differences of history, race and culture, as well as deep-seated and unresolved territorial claims. In my view, that may well eventually be so, but, and it's a big but, in the meantime, we need to focus on the French authoritarian leaders of these two countries and their mutual disdain for what they see as a rapidly declining West. The conjoining of the strategic ambitions of Beijing and Moscow highlights the differences in the global competition for power with the West and increases the potential for miscalculation and conflict. Both Beijing and Moscow see a West that they believe is preoccupied with debilitating challenges at home. Vladimir Putin has contempt for what he sees as a Europe that is weak and divided, and not least because of the Brexit by the UK. Xi Jinping believes that the world situation now strongly favors an ascendant China. He thinks time is on China's side, and he considers that China is well on its way to becoming the dominant power in Asia. Thus, China and Russia have commonly perceived threats regarding the West. If their military partnership continues its upward trend, it will affect the international security order, including by attempting to undermine the system of US-centered alliances in Asia and Europe. China and Russia are allied in a quest to refashion a world order that is safe for their respective authoritarian systems. Both leaders have reason to be gratified by global trends in this regard. To use Cold War communist language, and I quote, the correlation of world forces is moving in their favor. The rapid development of China's military capability, together with serious reforms in Russia's conventional and nuclear forces, is occurring when the US cannot fight two major regional conflicts simultaneously. One of Russia's leading experts on China, Alexander Lukin, has described Russia's partnership with China as a de facto alliance. And Putin himself has said he was not going to rule out the possibility of a more formal security relationship with China. But Lukin, who served in the Soviet foreign ministry and its embassy in China also states that Russia understands there are limits to its strategic cooperation with China. In the current edition of the Washington Quarterly, Lukin judges that the peak of Russian Chinese rapprochement, open quote, very likely has already passed, close quote. He goes further and asserts that, and, and asserts that this, open quote, does not mean China trusts sorry, does not mean that Russia trusts China, nor that it does not have concerns about China's more assertive behavior or will come anywhere close to a more formal alliance." Close quote. Even so, Lucan acknowledges that if the United States continues to pursue a hostile course towards both Russia and China, they will continue to maintain close relations. That being the case, the central challenge for Washington now is to detach Russia from China and draw Russia back into a larger West. But for the foreseeable future, there is little prospect of inveigling Russia to ditch its relationship with China 
while gambling on improving its hostile relations with the US and NATO. But that must remain the aim of the US if it is to reassert the leadership of the global balance of power. So turning now to how China and Russia view the West. In an Aspie publication in 2016, I observed that we live in an era when geopolitics is reasserting its place in the global order. I argued that great power revisionism has now returned and two great authoritarian powers, China and Russia, were fundamentally challenging the established international order. Both coercion and the use or threatened use of military power were back in, vo were back in vogue. Russia was seeking to carve out a sphere of influence in what it termed its near abroad in Europe, and China was using coercion against Taiwan and in the South and East China Seas to assert its rising great power status. Russia and China were leagued together, I said, in their rejection of what they saw as US hegemony and their view that the West has imposed on them the current international order which must now be rewritten in their favor. I believed we were seeing the emerging confrontation between two new power blocks, the authoritarian continental powers of China and Russia and the Western democratic maritime states led by America. That was five years ago. In the last five years, the attitudes of both China and Russia towards the West have hardened further. China seems to be confident that what President Xi Jinping calls the Chinese dream of revitalizing the country through the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation can now be achieved. President Xi has identified the period 2035 to 2050 as the next stage in China's economic growth in which it will become a prosperous, modern and strong socialist country with, and I quote, a world-class, unquote, military presumably to be recognized as a peer competitor of the US. Moreover, China sees its development as a potential model for other countries to follow, claiming the international community should view China's methods as unthreatening and constructive compared with those of the West. Beijing is seeking, is seeking to proselytize its authoritarian state capitalist regime as a superior model for developing countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America to follow. But Beijing is not copying the Soviet Union's attempts to export crude communist ideology. It is a much more sophisticated and appealing approach to countering the Western democratic model. As China State Councillor Yang Jiechi wrote in 2017, and I quote, we should share our governance experience with other countries." Close quote. In the initial two decades of the 21st century, China's leaders have benefited from what they view as a period of strategic opportunity while America was preoccupied in Afghanistan and the Middle East. For China to facilitate domestic economic development and expand its comprehensive national power, as it terms it. They are now focused on realizing a powerful China on the international stage, whose status as a great power will ultimately see it emerge as the preeminent power in the Indo-Pacific region. To this end, China has proposed two important concepts to establish its regional preeminence and expand its international influence. The first is the concept of a new type of major power relations which attempts to frame bilateral ties with the US as a peer relationship. The second is what it's called the new regional security concept for the Asia Pacific region, in which China seeks to establish regional security cooperation without US alliances, which Beijing portrays as an outmoded Cold War approach to creating military blocs. China proposes instead a new model of defense cooperation based on partnerships, albeit with China as the preeminent state or what it calls the big power. China continues to advocate for the construction of what it terms 
a community of common human destiny, whatever that means, while stressing that it will defend core territorial interests and that it is not afraid to respond militarily to provocation. All of this reflects an increasingly confident China whose leadership has a strong belief in China's destiny and that, at, and that at least for now, time is on its side. China is unhappy with the current international security governance architecture and has the political determination under Xi Jinping to restructure it in a new direction. It aims to do so with the help of countries that are not part of the US-led alliance system, and especially Russia. Russia and China are increasingly joining forces in the, in the international arena to balance against America, and bilaterally, their militaries are becoming much closer, as I've said. The Chinese Minister of National Defense, Wei Feng Zhei, boasted in April 2018, when he was visiting Moscow, open quote, to let Americans know about close ties between the armed forces of China and Russia, close quote. And by the way, in June of 2019, a Chinese major general here at the ANU, um, launching their new defense white paper, said precisely the same. We are demonstrating by our visit to Moscow the close relationship of our militaries and letting America know this. But let me stress, that is not going to be a return to the Sino-Soviet Treaty of Friendship, which existed from 1950 until it expired after acute differences in the 1960s over the Sino-Soviet split, the so Sino-Soviet border, and Soviet threats of nuclear war against China. It was replaced in 2001 by a Treaty of Good Neighborliness and Friendly Cooperation, which was signed by, Jack, by Jiang Zemin and Vladimir Putin. It provides inter alia for increased military cooperation, including the sharing of military know-how, namely China's access to Russian military technology. This treaty has just been renewed for another five years. A Russian expert from the Far Eastern Federal University in Vladivostok, our Chom Lukin, a different Lukin from the one I quoted earlier, states that Moscow and Beijing, and I quote, are sending the message that their strategic partnership is not a paper tiger. It is becoming a political military force to be reckoned with, he said. He further observed that, and I quote, China-Russia military missions outside their borders are bound to continue with increasing scale and sophistication. Alexander Lukin, the different one I quoted earlier, claimed in October 19 in China's propaganda newspaper Global Times that close Russian-Chinese military and security cooperation, open quote, will play a stabilizing role, close quote, in the Asia-Pacific region. The American historian Walter Russell Mead described in July 2019 current Russian and mili Chinese military activities as the latest manifestation of a deepening alliance between Russia and China. The then US Director of National Intelligence at that time also said that the two Eurasian powers are as close as they were in the 1950s. That may be so, but as the former Australian diplomat in Moscow, Bob Olo, has argued, the challenges and potential threats to Russian interests posed by the rise of China are formidable, not least the issue of the relative weakness of Russia vis-a-vis -vis China. Given Russia's slow decline and China's rapid rise, we might have expected that Russia would support Western efforts to balance China rather than undermine them. But the evidence now is accumulating to suggest that Russia's relationship with China is deepening, especially, as I've argued, militarily and technologically. And this carries distinctly negative geopolitical implications for the West, including Australia, for the foreseeable future. 
One of the most important factors in the global strategic outlook for us now is that Putin has similar negative views about the West as Xi Jinping. Putin's Russia seems set on a path to confrontation with the West and is now challenging the established post-World War II security order in Europe. He accuses the United States of promoting a model of unilateral domination and changing the balance of forces in order, and I quote, to have the opportunity to dictate their will to all, close quote. Putin also claims that America is seeking to change the political system and government in Russia. He consistently paints a picture of Russia as a victim and target of Western attacks over the centuries, with the West constantly trying to destroy it. The prospect of a strategic partnership with a liberal democratic Russia, yearned by many in the West after the collapse of the Soviet Union, in my view, has become a remote fantasy. Instead, Russia has turned its face away from its traditional focus on Europe, on a Europe that it sees as too weak, too indecisive, and too liberal to serve as a strategic partner for Russia. Putin now cultivates the idea of Russian exceptionalism, of Russia's unique, what he terms, Eurasian identity, as a country bestriding both Europe and Asia. In the enduring Russian intellectual debate between Westernizers and Slavophiles, which opposes the view of Russia as part of Europe against that of Russia as a distinct civilization with a world mission. The US-Ukrainian academic, Sergei Plochy, argues that the descendants of the Slavophiles and anti now have the upper hand in Russia. The crux of Russia's challenge to Europe is Putin's determination to reestablish Russian primacy in the eastern part of Europe and to use its Russian-speaking populations there as an excuse for intervention in the use or threatened use of force. An authoritarian Putin contemplates NATO starkly as a military threat and he speaks of it in hostile language that is redolent of the Cold War in its drumming up of ultra-nationalist sentiment on the home front. The Kremlin is not seeking incremental changes to the current order in Europe. Rather, it aspires to create a totally new one. It sees post-Soviet borders as something to be revised with military force if necessary. Putin perceives his country as facing a weakening Western adversary. The outlook then is for further inevitable friction and even confrontation between Russia and the West. The natural state of affairs for Russia, as far as Moscow is concerned, for Russia as a great power that should dominate its neighborhood and dictate its governing structures. The Kremlin's assertion that Europe is in decline and Russia is on the rise implies its belief that the conditions for a revision of the current European international order are improving. In the final analysis, a major military escalation on the European continent by Russia cannot be ruled out, either by miscalculation or perhaps by design. At the very least, there is now a potentially dangerous crisis between Russia and the rest about values and order in Europe. And as far as Moscow is concerned, not least about Ukraine potentially becoming a NATO member country. Turning now to what risks might China and Russia take. Risk taking in, inter in international affairs is a fraught business. It should be informed by experience in managing international crises and a thorough knowledge of one's adversaries. Unfortunately, these attributes are rare among modern political leaders. We live in an era of greater strategic disruption and increasing confrontation among the major powers. The disintegration of a coherent Western strategic leadership policy has far-reaching global import for middle powers such as Australia. In addition to the uncertainties surrounding the attitudes of both China and Russia, there has been the matter of the Trump administration in the United States, with its deliberate disruption of the international rules-based order and the place of American allies in it. 
This provided a further impulse to global disruption, which is largely to the benefit of 21st century authoritarian powers like China and Russia, able to operate more rapidly in a fluid strategic environment, including in a post COVID-19 world. So what risks might Beijing and Moscow take to recover what both countries consider to be historical territories belonging to the motherland? Let me make five points on this. First, it is important to understand that in China and Russia, we have two long established cultures different from the Western tradition. They have long memories of humiliation at the hands of the West. In the case of China, its occupation by European powers throughout much of the 19th century and then by Japan. And for Russia, successive waves of military attacks from Sweden, France and Germany from the 18th to the 20th centuries. In addition, they have both lost territories in the modern era provoked, they would claim, by Western interference. So, China believes that America continues to encourage the independence of Taiwan from China. For Moscow, it is the collapse of the former Soviet Union, which Putin describes as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, that he states has seen former Russian territories encouraged by the West to become separate countries and members of NATO. Both Russia and China have experienced historical circumstances when their societies have been weak and where the West has taken advantage, including, in their view, in their respective communist revolutions. Second, it is typical of large continental powers that they seek to establish territorial spheres of influence to guard their vulnerable frontiers. In the case of China, which is heavily dependent on international trade between the Indian and Pacific Oceans, the regime in Beijing is seeking to establish a sphere of influence in Southeast Asia and control of the South China Sea, through, through which much of its vital imports of oil pass. Putin claims the right to a sphere of strategic interest in Russia's neighborhood, in which Western influence and involvement will be limited. That sphere of influence includes not only Crimea and Ukraine, but in my view also Belarus, the Baltic states and Northern Kazakhstan, where there are substantial ethnic Russian minorities. Third, both China and Russia assert that they are deeply concerned about what they see as Western interference in their domestic political systems. China's 2019 defense white paper claims what it describes as separative separatist movements becoming more acute in places such as Taiwan, Tibet and Xinjiang, sometimes known as East Turkestan, which it states are a potential th serious threat to its domestic stability. Putin sees the color revolutions in Georgia and Ukraine as a Western precursor to undermining his own regime. Maintaining domestic stability and power at all costs is the priority of both these authoritarian regimes. Fourth, recovering lost territories also serves to divert the attention of the population away from domestic grievances towards external threats and, strokes a, and stokes a strong sense of nationalism that can easily be aroused in both China and Russia. Historically in international affairs, the open wound of lost territories has served as a potent instrument for building national sol solidarity and forging a strong national identity. So, Putin's grabs for territory in Georgia, Crimea and eastern Ukraine have been generally popular in Russia that has long held xenophobic views. Similarly, in China, there is strong nationalist support for Beijing's claim to the South China Sea, as well as reintegrating Taiwan and Hong Kong into a greater China. Fifth, both China and Russia have effectively used incremental territorial claims recently to their military advantage. China's creeping militarization of the entire South China Sea is now an established fact. Similarly, Russia's use of military force in Georgia, Ukraine and Crimea have been imposed without effective military challenges from the West whatsoever. 
In both Beijing and Moscow, there is every reason why they should consider these as effective models to continue demonstrating their great power status. Turning now to the implications for the West. There can be little doubt now that China and Russia are combining their forces to balance against the US, which they see as the common enemy. In the past, I have not considered that to be a practical proposition, given the deep-seated traditional antagonisms between Russia and China, the relative weakness of Russia vis-a-vis -vis China, and the fact that many in Russia consider China as a future security challenge. The Australian-Russian expert and former diplomat in Moscow, Bob Olo, mentioned earlier, characterizes Russia's relations with China as being hampered by ambivalence and a lack of trust, which results in a fairly cynical, what he terms, partnership of convenience. But he also recognizes that the risk of direct confrontation between the United States and Russia has increased tangibly putting Washington and Moscow on a collision course. In some respects, the current situation between Russia and the US is worse in my view than it was in the Cold War because it is more volatile and unpredictable and they are simply not talking to each other. The nuclear arms control agreements that exited, existed in the Cold War have been dumped, including the extremely important Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty of 1987 and the Anti-Ballistic Missile Defense Treaty of 1972, as well as the Open Skies Agreement, all of which, three of which America has dumped. The fact is that Russia's relations with China are now much closer than ever before. Putin seems to have concluded that the door to the West is closed and he has turned his back demonstrably on Europe. China is strong and decisive enough to serve as a strategic partner, while Russia seeks to reassert itself as an independent great power between Europe and China. Putin has said that the main struggle underway is that for global leadership. And this seems to imply that Russia is not going to contest China on this. For its part, China is responding to its newly competitive confrontation with the US by deepening its strategic relationship with Russia. China, let me stress, has no other strong major power relationships other than Russia. Its relations with Japan, India, and the major European powers, such as the UK, Germany, and France are poor. Both China and Russia are now allied in a quest to refashion the world order that is safe for their respective author authoritarian powers. Both leaders have reasons to be gratified by recent global trends, and in my view, they are outgaming the West. China and Russia believe they cannot afford to have poor relations with each other at a time of great strategic opportunity with the Western alliance now in disarray. The ANU's uh, Kyle Wilson, a good colleague of mine, concludes that perceptions of convergent strategic calculus between China and Russia outweigh both an historical legacy and tensions inherent in the relationship, especially Russia's junior status, and one of the sharpest cultural divisions anywhere. He states, neither side feels it can afford to have poor relations with the other for the foreseeable future. And I agree with that. This brings us to the other central issue of common concern for the West, the fact that un unlike in the post-Cold War decades, America is now incapable of fighting two major regional wars simultaneously. The rapid development of China's conventional military capability, together with serious reforms in Russia's military forces, is occurring at a time when America acknowledges it can fight only one major regional conflict and mount a holding operation in another regional conflict. The US National Defense Strategy acknowledges that America's competitive military advantage has been eroding and that the central challenge to US security is the re-emergence of long-term strategic competition with China and Russia. America aims to maintain favorable regional balances of power in both the Indo-Pacific and Europe, but that will be a particularly challenging task given China's rising power in Asia and Russia's flexing of its military muscles in Europe. So what are the implications of all this for the West? 
The fact is that the West is entering in a period of great strategic disruption and instability. America's obsession with looking inward and making America great again has opened fresh geopolitical possibilities for China and Russia. The most obvious risk for the West is, of course, that military confrontation with China and Russia might slide unpredictably into a state of general war. That would be a grave security implication for the Western allied community of not responding to an outright Chinese invasion of Taiwan or a Russian occupation of Estonia or Ukraine. So in conclusion, this paper demonstrates the need for Western scholars and the intelligence services to closely follow and understand China's strategic relationship with Russia. This is especially the case given Russia's attitude that the Western-led liberal system is collapsing and China's view that our future world will be divided along non-Western lines led by China and Western lines led by America. Deterring China and Russia and avoiding war by accident or through miscalculation is the most important demand on the current strategic outlook. But, but so is acceptance that what we are dealing with here is a stand, understanding what might be termed unknown knowns. That is, we know how particular territories figure in the historical and cultural memories of both China and Russia, but we do not know when and if they will decide to use military force to regain them. The implications for Australia not only relate to the dangers of armed conflict involving China and Russia against the West, some of these conflicts might involve Australia directly, for example, for example, Taiwan. Others, like Ukraine, we would be well advised to avoid. Because of our geography, the Chinese contingencies should be of more direct strategic relevance to us than those involving Russia in Europe. However, we might have to reconsider whether or not we would contribute to the defense of a democratic Estonia or other democracies in Eastern Europe that are members of NATO. But there is an important other issue for Australia much more directly. Moscow is now supplying China, as I've said, with increasingly advanced conventional weapons, quiet submarines, advanced combat aircraft, capable air defense systems, supersonic anti-ship missiles. These Russians will help China to erode our previously held margin of technological advantage against military forces in our region of primary strategic interest, which let me remind you is the Northeast Indian Ocean, Southeast Asia, including the South China Sea, the South Pacific and the Antarctic. Finally, all this leads me to the question, is there nothing that can be done about the growing strategic alignment between China and Russia? The classical balance of power response to such a question would be to postulate an American attempt to detach Russia and cement its partnership with the US. As I mentioned at the beginning, Brzezinski raised exactly such a possibility of establishing a sounder US relationship with Russia and peeling it away from China. He said this would require great geostrategic skill to prevent the emergence of a hostile coalition that could eventually seek to challenge America's primacy. France's President Macron also believes it's not in Europe's interest to drive Russia further into China's arms. However, improvements in relations between the EU and Russia will come neither quickly nor easily, according to a former German foreign minister. In the Cold War, the US and the Soviet Union sometimes made progress in one facet of their relationship, such as negotiating limits on their respective nuclear forces, while they remained in serious conflict over other aspects. Alas, history does not repeat itself like that. Russia now nurtures deep-seated hatred of the West. The state-controlled media in Russia portray the West, including the US and its allies, as irrationally and irre irrevocably hostile to Russia. And Putin believes that the previous Western-led international system has collapsed. Thus, nothing is likely to change the current adversarial nature of US-Russia relations. Brzezinski's warning 
that the most dangerous scenario facing US security would be a grand coalition of China and Russia is now fast becoming a geopolitical fact. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, you've given us lots to uh, ponder <laughs> and, uh, in, in what I think is a very comprehensive but uh, bleak um, picture of the global strategic environment or some elements of it. Uh, we have um, a couple of questions on the screen. Um, so I'd ask Tom Barber to ask your question, which I think is a very interesting one in the current environment. Tom, are you around? Uh, thanks, Brendan. And um, thanks, Paul. That was a, a really interesting talk. Um, yeah, so my question was, um, you outlined a very structural rationale for the deepening of Sino-Russian ties. Um, I was just wondering how important you think Xi and Putin's personal relationship mm -hmm. and their own kind of style of leadership is to the bilateral relationship. Thanks. That's a good question. I think it's very important. Um, I can be contradicted on this, but I think in the last 10 years, they've seen each other more than 18 times. Um, they are quite similar styles. They're quite private, stark people. They enjoy being authoritarian leaders. And I think they are increasingly sharing the worldview that the West is deeply in trouble. Now, Putin, I think, is well set presuming his health remains in order for an even longer term of relationship, perhaps exceeding that of Stalin of 18 years. And Xi Jinping is making it clear, isn't he, that he thinks of himself as president for life. Now, what could, you know, disable this is one or the other of them dying. But in the meantime, mm. I think the answer to your question is they will remain very solid in their relationship. Thank you. Um, another question from John Blackslin. John, would you like to ask your question? Thanks, Brendan, and thanks, Paul. Uh, always entertaining and thought-provoking hearing you speak and articulate your thoughts on these issues, Paul. Thank you. Um, especially uh, for this occasion, remembering our great, late, great colleague, Professor Des Ball. Um, I'm wondering, can you comment on the effect of Russian engagement in ASEAN. How ambitious and capable is Russia in seeking to influence ASEAN member states, notably including, of course, Indonesia? And in response, what do you see as Australia's policy options? Look, Russia, as you well know, has had a long interest um, in ASEAN. And let's remember our audience, um, at one stage at the time of Indonesian confrontation with Singapore and Malaysia, Russian Russia was the primary military supplier of equipment to Indonesia. You know, MiG-21s, quiet submarines, when we had no submarines, um, uh, 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 other important military equipment. Since the end of the Cold War and the disintegration of Russia, particularly under Prime Minister Primakov, um, uh, Russia's focus on Asia drifted. In fact, Russia's focus on China drifted. And my personal experience in the last 10 years or so, when, when, as you know, I was involved with a certain ASEAN regional forum grouping on preventive diplomacy, the Russian attendance changed every year, as did the Chinese one, by the way, just to destabilize us. Um, the Chinese took the discussion seriously. I think the Russians uh, were, out, were out, as usual, shopping somewhere in Singapore. <laughs> More recently, at a visit that some of us made five years ago to Moscow, we found a, more, a greater focus on ASEAN, and I'm seeing that since then. Um, and, you know, Russia is careful not to contradict China, but just think of this. You and I know Russia continues to supply military equipment to Vietnam, to Indonesia, yes, to Malaysia, yes. And how much further can it go in that regard without upsetting China's view that it is the natural dominant power 
in Southeast Asia. So by the way, I'm not arguing there aren't some incipient strains between these two <coughs> countries. Okay, thank you. Um, Hamish McDonald, would you like to ask your question? Um, can you hear? Um, Paul, yeah. um, wonderful talk and greetings to all Des's friends. Um, I just want to ask about India. Um, the US, as part of the Quad push with Australia supporting, seems to be trying to detach India from Russia in the defence sphere. Uh, is this a wise move? Wouldn't it be better to have India offering the uh, Russians a hedge on their relationship with China um, and uh, possibly uh, uh, affecting a, a certain balance in, in Moscow's relationship with, with the Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific? Good question, Hamish, and hello. Um, uh, India, as you know, has traditionally been a very important part, partner to uh, Moscow. Um, and when India was not as involved with the West and was a very important leader of the uh, you know, third party non-aligned movement, uh, Russia continued to supply um, significant military equipment, and it is still doing that. Although I carefully note, Hamish, and this is the difference. You remember I've said in the past, as recently as 10 years ago, Russia was military equipment it would not supply to China. That has rapidly disappeared. So the sort of kit that Russia is supplying to India is okay, but it is not equivalent to the best Russian equipment, or certainly not to advanced Western equipment. And India, as you know, is increasingly looking with American encouragement about buying uh, Western and especially American military equipment. So what you've introduced is, you know, yet another complication into, and I didn't want to sort of make it appear that it was a simple uh, unchallenged bilateral relationship. Um, we see that in some other areas where China in the United Nations um, did not, did not um, condemn Russia's occupation of Crimea, but instead abstained. And you've seen some Russian uh, attitudes in that regard about the South China Sea. So, you know, I wouldn't want to leave people with the idea that this is not an uncomplicated China-Russian relationship. Thank you. Adil, do you want to ask a question? You've got your hand up. Thank you, Paul, uh, for the presentation. Uh, Paul, like just uh, a couple of observations. Uh, like China and Russia are under a collective security arrangement under Shanghai Treaty Organization since 1990s. And then and that's continued more than a two decades. And that has become very functional in the, least, uh, in, the, in the last seven years first. So the platform was already there for them in, on which uh, they were co uh, collaborating. Second is uh, the introduction of uh, One Belt, One Road. So if you go to the Central Asia, the relationship between China and Russia in Central Asia is like a love-hate relationship. Mm. because uh, Russia doesn't have that sort of economic power. So most of the investments from China during the last eight years have been in Central Asian states, which used to be a territorial, uh, like in terms of uh, security arrangements and other political uh, affiliations, the Russian's territory. So China, like Russia was not interfering in that sphere. So it was a sort of peaceful coexistence between them but what like and that's functioning but what has heightened like when i was uh, listening to this talk uh, and thanks for the very detailed one what i have observed that we are assuming that something very unusual is happening and very like a new initiative has like something very uh, like a strengthened relation of is a strengthened cooperation between russia and china is developing but my question over the recent developments of the past four months is is it, it like instead of ascribing uh, a proactive uh, 
initiatives on the part of Russia and China. Isn't it the disengagement by the West itself, which is providing a platform for the Russia and China to cooperate? For example, like the recent development during three months, US has disengaged itself from the region and none of the European states have got engaged during the last one or uh, two months. Mm. So that is provide that has created a vacuum. And uh, like all activities which are taking in terms of like discussions and negotiation, China is there, Russia is there, all the regional powers there, but like the West is missing. Mm. Let, me, let, me, be- let, me, let me answer your question yeah. because there are other questioners. Um, again, I mean, Central Asia is a group of artificially devised countries, devised by Stalin when he was running the nationalities policy of the new Bolshevik regime. You are right, of course, it was seen by Russia as you know, part of their natural sphere of influence. And that was important when they invaded uh, Afghanistan in December 1979. We are now seeing, of course, that China is using its economic power, the sort of power Russia doesn't have, and I do expect to see increasing strains between China and Russia over Central Asia. However, quite frankly, that is not the central geopolitical issue of the future of the world in terms of the balance of power and the risk of major power war. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I've got a question from Ali Khan, and then I'll go to Peter Jennings. So Ali, you first. Ali, are you there? Okay, well, let's um, go to Peter. Peter, your question? Peter, are you there? Okay. Yes, I am. Sorry, Brendan, I'm just uh, fiddling with my iPad there. Uh, Paul, nice to see you. Thank you for your talk. And uh, it's great to have an opportunity to remember Des in this way. Um, I I had a few conversations with Des uh, in his latter years about conventional arms control in the Asia Pacific, which was an issue that he was getting increasingly interested in and I think wanting to spend more time on. Do you have any thoughts about that agenda now? Is it completely dead in the water, so to speak, or is it something that should be perhaps being considered by uh, the United States and and other interested powers? uh, I'd be interested in your view. Yeah, good question, Peter. I mean, um, what is remarkable about the Asia Pacific is the lack of arms control agreements in a part of the world that is leading the world in terms of militarization um, and nuclear proliferation. Um, I think, you know, the issue for America is is not only the fact that whilst it's cancelled things like the IMF Treaty, which you and I could debate, it has extended the New START agreement, which limited, limits America and Russia to 1,500 each. But you will know, when you count up the total number of strategic nuclear warheads they each have, it's about 6,500. And when you then come to the situation of a China that refuses to be involved, in nuclear arms control agreements because it claims it has such small forces. <clears throat> According to the Pentagon, Pentagon, you know, in the order of the low 200s of strategic nuclear warheads. But you and I have both seen in recent weeks and months, China looking to very substantially increase its strategic nuclear forces. And in addition, coming centrally to your point, China has about 2000 uh, theater um, uh, ballistic missiles Uh, 80% of which are capable of carrying nuclear warheads. And to see a situation of the relationship of America with China, where that issue is not on the negotiating table, I think is a central issue. Okay, I'll just read Ali's question. He doesn't have a mic, so I'll read it out. Um, Thank you so much for sharing these opinions. Russia has had nuclear weapons longer than the British and a bigger military for almost a century now, at least since World War II. 
Putin has been in power for 20 plus years. When do you think Putin will start his all out war and confrontation with the West, if ever? And the British have invaded an, an, an ex island, 1980s Belfast, and have been engaged in war with the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, since the Irish started demanding independence and a split from the UK and more recently threatened to join the EU. How is Ukraine different from Ireland? Interesting question. Um, I th the issue of Putin, uh, I'm not arguing he's, he easily wants a war with Europe, but he, I think his contempt for the weakness and divisions which are growing in Europe uh, will, en will encourage him to be more demanding and as I've argued, um, he wants to see a protective barrier, a sphere of influence, when he's now faced, from a Russian point of view, with NATO knocking on his door, doorstep, and his client states of the Baltic Republics um, and the other East European former members of the Warsaw Pact. The, the, the issue that will trigger uh, Putin to quickly answer your question, is if, if NATO is so stupid and ill-advised as to make Ukraine a member of NATO, that will be, from Putin's point of view, a cause for war. Mark my words. He will not tolerate it. Okay. Um, Conor McGuinness, are you there? Yes, thank you very much, Professor Dib, for your talk. And you, I might have stolen my thunder by your la last answer, but I was asking how much of a factor is post-Cold War expansion of NATO and EU overtures in Russia's near abroad in facilitating the now warm relationship between Russia and China? If it is significant, is there a way to mitigate any of the, ef any of the effects of this, or is it now too late? As you know, there are different Russian and Western views uh, on the issue of was was Gorbachev promised that there would be no further expansion of NATO after making uh, Germany a unified state? There are different views on that. Um, the fact that uh, NATO now is pressing on Russia's borders um, and its approaches to Moscow which, as you know, territorially have been the usual invasion route. There is no doubt that from Putin's point of view, um, the creation of a NATO that was imposed upon Russia when it was weak, divided, and had disintegrated without raising any military force whatsoever. We've never faced a situation when a great military power like the Soviet Union, voluntarily disintegrated without going to war. Um, I've just said in answer to the previous question, the thing that will trigger Putin, whether we like it or not, and I know a lot of people will disagree with me, is making Ukraine a member of NATO. A lot of Russians, including Putin, Putin calls um, uh, uh, Putin our family. Um, they are fellow Slavs. We believe in the same religion. Um, the creation of the state of Russia started off in Kiev way back over a thousand years ago. So uh, I think he's turned his back now on Europe because of all that. Um, and in that sense, uh, Putin uses this phrase, which I find a very difficult phrase, and it's one I can't define. His turn to China is also his turn towards defining Russia, not as a European power, not as a European culture, but as a Eurasian country. Okay, Natalie Lakely, uh, you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I guess, uh, um, first of all, thank you so much for what an excellent presentation. I wish we could have applauded you after that. It's quite um, <laughs> odd being on Zoom and not being able to do that. 
But I guess my question was that we've just had this big AUKUS, annou- AUKUS announcement. Mm. Um, and given, given everything you've been explaining about the Russian Chinese ambitions, whether it's, you know, distinguishing themselves from the West and, you know, um, this kind of great Anglosphere um, kind of, you know, this is their kind of risk and threat perspective to kind of the deterrence posturing that they are um, putting forward. Do you, what, where does that leave the AUKUS announcement? Will it be a good deterrence, a greater deterrence posture for Australia? Or is it really reinforcing those Russian and Chinese perspectives of the, the um, Anglosphere concerns? I think both of them um, will see it as another um, a challenge uh, by Ameri- led by the United States. Um, as it so happens, by the way, I've only just got in from Moscow, uh, a piece by the Carnegie Moscow Center by a man called Andrei Kortunov. And he he raises the question, should Russia see um, this new alignment uh, between Australia, uh, sorry, this new arrangement between Australia, the UK and America as a threat? And with the pronouncement of a new Asian NATO, and including places, you know, like, will Japan join it and India and so on. But he backs away from that. Um, uh, it, it does not see it as a, an AUKUS attempt for a modern alternative to NATO. But what he does say is, in his conclusion, and let me quote, today AUKUS looks like a rickety and unstable structure cobbled together in a hurry. But in 20 years time, it might have the most severe consequences for the rest of the world if it enlarges itself. He sees that as the long-term danger of AUKUS. So it, it contradicts himself in a way, but to answer your question, the, there's nothing new about the tripartite relationship. Uh, okay, in the past it's been the five power arrangement, but with respect to New Zealand, it's always been not a central part of that relationship when it comes to military relationships. And AUKUS is about not just nuclear powered submarines, it's about the three of us having access to the very advanced technologies of cyber war, um, artificial intelligence, uh, um, uh, and, and other high technology items like um, hypersonic missiles. And people have underrated that. It's not just about the nuclear submarines. So I think both China and Russia will look at this with some alarm and they'll have to take notice of it. And China will have to face a situation where when we eventually in 20 years time get these submarines, they will still be the most quiet and capable submarines probably still in the world. Okay, now someone identified as S890404D has a question. Would you like to <laughs> yourself and ask a question? Okay. Defected. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, Ian Russell. Is he in there? Okay, James Ball. James Ball, are you there? Oh, sorry, he did have a microphone. Sorry, I'll read it out. Sorry, um, I, yeah. I, sorry, I just had a bit of trouble. I'm unmuting my microphone. Okay, we'll go to you, Ian, and then um, I'll read out James Ball's question after that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, you noted that Putin has indicated that he, that he would not rule out a defence alliance with China at some time in the future. Mm. This would, of course, be a big and concerning step. How far do you think such an alliance or the real prospect of one in China's perception might embolden or restrain perhaps China's behaviour in the North Pacific, in particular in regard to Taiwan? Yeah. Look, the... The issue of Russia in this regard um, and what sort of, if you like, Putin's throw a line, 
which by the way was at the meeting of the Valdai discussion club where he, he gives his usual two hour lecture and answers you know a further three hours of questions it, i can't imagine a situation where you would have this sort of um formal treaty alliance between china and russia like nato and by which i mean article five of nato an attack on one is an attack on all but i have questioned in my own mind um and pushed it away if you like that could the strategic alignment and cooperation between china and russia against what they see let me repeat as a weakening west not only america but also nato europe would they for instance coordinate under such a future new treaty you you chinese attack taiwan and we russians will mount a significant operation against estonia um or something like that um knowing that as i said very clearly and let me repeat they must be both looking at the fact that china that sorry washington admits they can no longer fight two major regional wars simultaneously and you see what i'm trying to postulate now it's not an argument um i'm willing to you know go public on in any detail it's a question rattling around in my own mind is the answer to your question because it would really complicate for instance the taiwan situation for america okay we have one time for one last question which i'll read out from james ball <clears throat> hi paul thank you very much for a fascinating discussion prior to the outbreak of the first world war the balkans were referred to as the powder keg of europe Mm. Is there any place uh, or events that you see as being the modern powder keg for future conflicts? And I presume this is James Ball, the uh, the, the son of of Des that we're, we're talking about. Uh, when, and James, feel free to come and visit us at the Strategic Defence Studies Centre. It's hard to draw strict parallels like that, in my view. But if there's two parts, you know, of the world that um, I'm sort of focusing on and seriously worried about. Taiwan is the obvious one. I wouldn't call it the Balkans of um, of Asia, but I I sense that if you don't believe the drums of war are sounding, um, I've been to China four times in the last six years, which I could never do as a an official. It is a vibrant democracy with a regular change of government. We had a few years ago the sunflower movement in which the students occupied the parliament. I mean, imagine that happening in Beijing or Moscow. Um, and they're nice people, unlike the people across the strait. Um, uh, if that happens, it's anyone's guess how it will develop and what, whether it will get out of control. Coming back to Moscow, would it caution? china about that or would it as i've just mentioned earlier james see it as an opportunity to put some pressure on a weak read like for instance um its view of an estonia with a very substantial russian population which moscow could use as an excuse um and let me tell you by the way the distance from um st petersburg to the eastern Estonian border is about the distance from Canberra to Cooma. Okay, <clears throat> that's a good note to uh, finish on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, coming back to geography, as we always do. On behalf of everyone, Paul, I'd like to say thank you for a really um, terrific um, discussion and a very interesting lecture, which I think um, all of us uh, as interested commentators, people in the community, um, those of us who work in academia and those in the policy community need to reflect on. And so I'd like to um, acknowledge that. And um, we look forward to um, continuing this discussion in the future. <laughs>